this feast of the Immaculate Conception of our Lord, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the principal feast of the Society of St. Pius X, which we renew our oblations, and those who want to be making this first oblation today as a promise to be faithful to the statutes of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and the Society of St. Pius X. And also this year in the seminary, we are doing today, we're finishing our 30th day of our preparations for the consecration of our seminary to the Sacred Heart of our Lord Jesus Christ and also to the Immaculate Heart as a family, a little seminary family. And so we'll do that consecration and enthroning into the Sacred Heart in our refectory uh, in, the, in the seminary building after the Mass today. And then have a little feast afterwards in the throne also of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and doing the prayers of the consecration of our seminary as a family, as the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of our seminary and the King of all of our work at Our Lady of Mount Carmel and of course at the Society of St. Pius X, Marian Corps. And uh, on this feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So a few considerations then, the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, men. <coughs> Dear Father, as your seminarians, as your faithful, on this day, we consider this 30th day of the consideration of the Sacred Heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And on this 30th day, the final day, we are to consider the death of our Lord. That the side of our Lord Jesus Christ communicates it is the Sacred Heart, and that on that day of Good Friday, when our Lord Jesus Christ died upon the cross, he was truly dead, and his body was truly deceased. And let's remember that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. And it is a dogma of our faith and an, and an, ad, a, an undeniable fact of history that the man Jesus Christ, just as much of men as we are, that man died. He truly died as completely as we died. His soul was separated from his body. It was wrenched apart from his body, and his body was in the sleep of death. He was not tired. He was not resting. He was not in, 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 in a state of a kind of a coma. He was truly and completely dead. There was a separation of the soul from the body, and his body was truly dead. And like any other human body, I can do many things when I am alive, but I can do nothing when I'm dead. And we see the first proof of the divinity of Jesus Christ. The very first proof that he really is God, though he is truly dead. The soldiers have witnessed his death, all mankind witness his death, and it is a true death. Many modern fools try to claim, since he rose from the dead three days later, that he was not completely dead. He is completely and totally dead. There is no life inside of the body of Jesus Christ, and his humanity is now incapable of doing anything. His human body cannot breathe, cannot move a finger, cannot make a single sound of any kind. Its body is completely immovable, Unable to move itself. It is completely dead. And after a few hours of this death, what happened? A soldier came and he opened the side of Jesus. And here the Carthusians tell us, note what the Holy Scripture says. It does not say he tore. It does not say he wounded. It does not say he attacked. It does not say that anything violent happened. But rather, a few hours after the death of Jesus Christ, his side was opened. When we open a door, we do not claim that the house is violated. The, 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 the master comes to the door, says our Lord Jesus Christ. The thief comes by another way. And so that soldier, though he had an evil heart, though he had a wicked intention, what was he trying to do? Ensure death. When Jesus Christ cried out with a loud voice, 
and gave up the ghost, that ensured death. There was no need to prove the death of that real man, and he is now dead for several hours, and is unable to move. Therefore the Carthusians tell us, he cannot be wounded, he cannot be attacked, he cannot be harmed, because his soul is passed into the other life. The human soul of Jesus Christ is down in limbo, and has descended into hell, and it is busy now communicating with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and with Adam and Eve, and all the great saints of the Old Testament. He is preaching to them about his coming and his life. That's what the human soul is doing. Remember that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all Noah and Moses and all the great prophets of the Old Testament, they had connection to God. They had connection to the divinity of the Messiah. But now they can see his human soul. The human soul of God made man is now before them. And the human soul is talking to them as a way that souls communicate. And they are enjoying the presence of the human soul of Jesus Christ. But exactly at the same time, on earth, the disciples and the apostles and the holy women, they are ripped apart in pain and anguish because the human body is now dead. And they are overtaken by the death and by the stillness of the body of Christ. When Joseph of Arimathea and St. Nicodemus take down that cross, take Jesus Christ off that cross, they know how dead he really is. He is unable to do anything except be moved as they move him. His fingers and his hands are arranged in the tomb as it is arranged by them. He is dead as dead can be. But in that brief period before Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came to take down the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, a spear opened his side. It was open. <coughs> and out flowed blood and water. And here we see the first proof of the divinity that even when we are dead, God still operates. Even when we are dead, God is still in control. And there are many souls that are dead. There are very many souls that do not know, do not love, or do not serve God, that do not hold the true faith, and they are dead. And there are many souls in the true faith who are also dead because they have not charity in their hearts, and they have not the love of God, but are filled with love of the pleasures of this world and the love of the things of this world. And therefore they are dead. And they do not love God. They are truly dead. Now what is the great power of the divinity? It is not so great a power of the divinity that he can move those that are already alive, that he can get his friends to do his bidding. But what is the greatest power of the divinity is that he can move a truly dead body with truly dead immobile blood and make pure and clean water come out from the side of a dead body. We know that when someone has really died, and if you cut the person, blood does not flow forth, blood does not gush forth. This cannot happen unless the heart is alive. When we are alive and you cut someone, you cut an artery, blood comes powering forth. It comes spewing forth because the blood is moving and is in a living body. <coughs> but in a dead body, this cannot happen. And yet, when that soldier, St. Longinus, opened the side of Jesus Christ, and the spear went from the right side all the way past bones and sinews until it arrived at the heart, all was normal as he pierced as he had so many times familiarly done. He had pierced the side of so many dead bodies. It's like hitting a sack, a dead sack with a spear, with a thud and no movement. 
But this time he felt the normal thing that he had felt so many times when he had pierced the side of any dead man or any dead animal. He pushed the spear through. There was no gushing for it. And then it went into the heart and out gushed with great power and great force as if the heart was still fully alive, blood and water. And this shows the power of the divinity that this man truly was God. The soldiers were the first to see his divinity. They saw it when, he, when, the, when, the, when the death happened and he cried out with a loud voice and they noticed something. This man is crying with the fullness and the strength of his voice. And yet he's been dying such a, over such a long time. No man, after such a long amount of pain, has strength. Any man dies with a whimper, but this man cries out with the fullness of strength of his voice. And the soldiers said, indeed he must be God. They were the first ones to say that. <coughs> and then he gave up the ghost at the moment of his own choosing. And then there was an earthquake, and the sky was darkened because Jesus Christ had died. And these were small signs. But several hours later, when that spear opened the side of Jesus Christ, this showed his true divinity. Now how is it that we know that our Catholic Church is the one true church? What is our proof? It is not our proof that there have been so many saints down the last 2,000 years. This is, except when we see where those saints came from, such as St. Augustine and St. Ignatius. And so many of the great saints, where did they come from? They began their life of sanctity when they were dead. They were dead and enemies of God, and they hated God. But the grace of God touched their dead souls and brought them to life. Hence, we must recognize that when death is all around us, and we're in a world that is dead in its intellect, men have forgotten and know not truth, the minds of modern man are dead. And the hearts of modern man completely dead. There is no charity and no love in the heart of the modern man except a little bit of a residue of a misguided and weak love of self. That's all that barely remains. But even that is disappearing as suicide increases throughout the world and as despair increases and as the desire of those that love themselves Tend to, they tend to desire less valuable things, less important things. The world is dead. The hearts are dead. The minds are dead. The culture is dead. All of our society is dead. And we see around us true death. What are we to do at that time? Remember our Lord Jesus Christ said, when you see all manner of wars and rumors of wars, when you see all kinds of terrible things happen, lift up your head, because your redemption is at hand. Your redemption is nigh. Why is this redemption nigh when we are dead? It is to remind us of a simple truth. Every good that is in me, including the natural goods that are inside of me, the goods of my health, the goods of my talents, the goods of my mind, the goods of my heart, all of the goods that are inside of me only come from God. And if we take God away, what remains? Nothing. Nothing remains. Emptiness remains. And that's the way it always is. Take away God and the stars fall from the heavens. The hair falls out of our head. Our life ceases to be. And that's the way it always is. But God allows us to experience death and to exceed death all around us, that we rational creatures might remember. Because one of the problems of us rational creatures is our reason is twisted, and we believe that we are alive, and that life is mine. No, my life comes from God, and my life is nothing without God. Therefore, he allows that there should be death. Can the dead rise? It's impossible. What's well, the greatest proof that a man is a man of God? That he takes the dead and he rises them from the dead. <coughs> Elias rose from the, the dead from, to life. Eliseus rose the dead from life to life. Many of the saints rose the dead to life. 
And Jesus Christ, so many times before this death of his himself, he rose the dead from life. But how does he prove that God is deeply in his own body, even when he's dead? When that dead body, in its death, can still show signs of life, and can still vivify others. And this is what happens when Jesus Christ is dead upon the cross. He shows that he is truly God. And he will wait until the third day to definitively prove that he is God. Because no man, including the man Jesus Christ, because he's a real man, the man Jesus Christ cannot rise from the dead. The man Jesus Christ, in his death, cannot make blood flow from his heart. The man, Jesus Christ, cannot move one finger of his human hand once he is dead. He has no power to do that because he's a real and true man. But it happens anyway. And why does it happen? Because he is not only man, he is God. And we must remember in our holy church that it is very human. It is so very human. We see that when we see our fellow priests, when we see our fellow Catholics, amongst the laity, and the Holy Father in Rome. And when we see all of those, the Catholics, we see these are very human. They show greed, and they show selfishness, and they show all manner of weakness, and all manner of sin. They are so very human. And we look upon their humanity, and we see that all flesh is subject to decay. And so it's normal that our church decays. And so we see the church decay. All, subject, all flesh is, separate, is subject to separate soul from body and to go to death. And so we see our church going to death. And we see how can we turn back the tide. We are so old and feeble. Our muscles are so, are so uh, lost of their energy. We have not exercised them anymore. We don't exercise our prayer muscles. We don't exercise our faith muscles. We don't exercise our muscles of charity. And how can we just all of a sudden make charity happen? How can we all of a sudden make faith happen? Remember on that day, on Easter Sunday, St. Mary Magdalene had no faith. She did not believe that Jesus Christ could ever rise from the dead. She knew for certain that it was impossible. But how long did it take to fix that death that was inside of her mind and that death that was inside of her heart? It took one instant and one second of connection to the divine power. That's what it took. So we are in a world now that has so much lies in it, and so much evil in it, and so much corruption in it. We are raised with the corruption of our modern world. Our minds corrupted from the moment that we begin to, be, to learn as a baby about the foolishness of evolution, and about the ignorance of the modern teaching, and about modernism and all its wickedness. And we raise up in all this wickedness. How long will it take for God to fix this problem? He takes one drop of his divinity... And he touches it to our wicked humanity. He touches it to our dead humanity. He touches it to our weakness. And in an instant, it is cured. This is time for us to make sure that we have a very deep faith. When we are close to death, what must be done? We turn to the heart of Jesus. We consecrate our seminary to the most sacred heart. Because at the very beginning of time, what happened? the time of our redemption. God decided to make a most immaculate virgin. She had a most immaculate and beautiful birth. And she was conceived immaculate, she was born immaculate, and she was always immaculate. And then when we arrive at the death, we will see the most sacred heart. She'll have an immaculate death. And there should be a perfect cleanness at the beginning and perfect cleanness at the end. And God shall touch the very soul of, Jesus, of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the body of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the very first moment of its conception, making her free from all original sin and beautiful and magnificent from the very beginning, just like he had done with Adam and Eve, only more beautiful in her. And we arrive at the very end, and Jesus Christ has been killed and filled with the filth of all of our sins, not only our mortal sins, but also our venial sins that are imperfections. Each of them spits upon Christ. Each of them causes him infinite pain. Each of them brings dirt and filth and blood and pain to our Lord Jesus Christ and kills his body. 
and breaks his heart, and even his great human heart, so closely connected with divinity, even that heart, protected by the divinity, what did it do? It died. That greatest of human hearts stopped beating because of my sins. The greatest of human hearts stopped being able to move and do any good. But what happened? God did not wait until the third day to raise the heart. On the third day, he will raise the entire body of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he let the heart of his human, his human heart be touched by divine power on the very day of Good Friday itself. So that when he went to death, and when he descended into limbo, and descended into hell, and spoke with all the saints in limbo, he left his heart behind. And he left his heart able to touch us, and he even brought about a conversion, the conversion of St. Longinus. He brought about a conversion during the time of his own death. And while he was dead, he made sure his divinity was still there, touching the heart. We must understand, as we have so many souls in the world today who are enemies of God, and so many souls immersed in all kinds of sin, what must be done? Have confidence in the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the most immaculate heart of his mother. And at the beginning and the end, let the immaculate heart be with us in the sacred heart. And even if we find ourselves dead, even if we find ourselves no longer the friends of God, in a state where the devil is trying to get us to go into the deepest despair, right now the devil is trying to make despair the normal state for the world today. We must battle against that despair and recognize that though the heart of Jesus Christ is truly dead, the divinity can still touch it. And the divinity will still touch it as you get closer and closer to the victory of Mary. And so after the sermon today, we have several prayers to say. We'll take some time. First of all, we renew our, our, our oblation uh, to the, uh, our, our, our consecration. Well, first we do the oblation, the society oblation. We'll open the tabernacle and renew the society oblation. And uh, also one we make in the first oblation this time. And then, and then uh, of the society, a promise of the society of St. Pius X. As we continue the work of our Trisha Lefebvre, the society of St. Pius X and the Marian Corps. Again, some modernism going on in the church today, and unfortunately within the society of St. Pius X, which continues to get weaker and weaker, and no longer standing with the backbone of Archbishop Lefebvre, no longer standing firmly against the modern errors, such as the wickedness of the vaccines that are being brought upon us, and the wickedness of the, of the, of the, the, the whole of the Catholic religion being more and more persecuted, and yet the, 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 the Catholic Church is not standing strong against its persecution, or standing strong to defend its sheep. And so we pray for the society of St. Pius X's mainstream to come back to its senses and return to the statutes and spirit of our sister Marcel Lefebvre and for the Holy Mother Church, that the wicked bishops and priests within it that are not following the law of God return to the following of the law of God and live according to the holy priesthood and as our ancestors live. And we renew our oblations, first of all. And after that, then we will have the, uh, the renewal of the consecration of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which we made in February 2nd, a couple years and a half ago, and uh, renewal of that consecration of the Sacred Heart of uh, the Blessed Virgin of Our Lady Mount Carmel and our seminary and all the work. And then thirdly, we'll pray again the 30th day devotions of the 30 days of the Sacred Heart. We'll do the 30th day of the devotion to the Sacred Heart, the 30th day uh, prayer of the Sacred Heart in preparation for this consecration today. And then we'll complete the Mass. Then at the end of the Mass, we'll get unvested. And then immediately we'll process down to the refectory, down to the seminary building. And then, uh, and there we'll process so without surplus, without without the without liturgical vestments, down to the seminary, and then we'll do the consecration of our seminary family to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and complete the consecration to, to the Sacred Heart, and then also renew the, and the consecration of the Immaculate Heart, and then we'll have a feast uh, of the of the, the, the Immaculate Conception, and uh, to close out the evening. So, so after this sermon, we have a bunch of prayers, and then we will finish the Holy Mass. Close out. God bless you all. Then, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.